Well, good morning in the building. Got a few people in the building. Good morning to those online. Go ahead, clap. <laughs> right? It, it is um, just uh, good to see some people in the building. It is good to be with you online. Let me, while I'm mentioning that, uh, tell you what uh, to be paying attention over the next um, uh, week because you will have details that we will put out as to what will be happening Next week, we will be having a 9 o'clock online. We will also be having, at the same time, an in-person service for so many people. Uh, we have our sanctuary set up. You should see it in here this morning. We got all this six-foot distancing between chairs. It's kind of actually kind of cold and weird all at the same time. It's kind of like me. But anyhow. <laughs> and, um, but we're also still having the 11 o'clock drive-in next week. We will probably be doing something like that for a number of weeks, but we will get you the details. Um, so, but there is also an 11 o'clock drive-in today. Now, let me uh, start with this. Happy Mother's Day. Those of you who are here, those online, happy Mother's Day. Let me go over here and be obedient to Pastor Troy. I know, he's now saying, there he goes. I have 72 lights on him. He's leaving the light. Yes, I am. Follow me, Troy. I have to go over here and say happy Mother's Day to my mother. I'll even bring her into the light for you. How am I doing? How am I doing? I can bring her into the light. This is my mama. I'll come even closer. Daryl said come closer. How close should I come, Daryl? Good. All right. This is my mama. I say happy Mother's Day to her. If I have any uh, uh, faith or goodness in me, it started with her faith. And when she, you know, 1975-ish, roughly 75 left uh, the Catholic Church, came to the very church I now pastor. Um, it was a bold step of faith, and um, never in her wildest dreams did she think that I'd end up being a pastor. Uh, she colors her hair because the gray. I do not. The, oh, I okay. Do. You know, because I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure there's some gray in there that I caused. I, I taught her how to pray. She's never said thank you. Oh, but, you know, if. if my knees still hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking. I got the mic, <laughs> okay? Anything good that I might be started because of her and my father, and because of her. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Love you, too. All right. <laughs> you know, um, also, I want to say this. Um, maybe she's watching. Maybe she's not. It's a very special day. One of the, one of the happiest days of my life is today. Um, lots of happy days in my life. But one of the happiest days of my life is today because today is, and I can't see a thing. Whew. Watch this. I'm going to look like Jerry Jones. Remember Jerry Jones had his son-in-law clean his glasses during a football game? Teresa, help me out. Look at those things. I can't see a thing. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but anyhow, today, May 10th, is a very happy day for me because it was seven years ago today that Carson was born, my granddaughter, and, uh, you know, we, we just have so much fun together. And um, so I want to say to her, if she's watching, happy birthday, baby. I love you, and uh, you're the best, all right? All right, I got all that in. I want to speak to you. I'm going to say something now that I've never said before. And that's, all right? I've never said this before. I don't do this kind of stuff. But that typically means that I really believe what I'm about to say is important. And I'm going to say this because I, I believe I have a message today that is incredibly important to every sphere of our life, government, family, church. And I believe the message I have is so important that I'm going to say something to those of you who are watching online and maybe even in this room. Watch this. This, so, so, this just seems so self-serving. It's so against my nature. Hit the share button. I, I, I hit the share button. I believe it's that important today. I believe it's important for the era that we're in. I believe it is important um, for your family. I believe it is important for the church. I believe it is important for local government. I believe it is important um, in so many spheres of our life that I believe that it is something that we need to get out. Now, I say that, but let me say something about that. Because I don't like to appear to be narcissistic or self-serving and that kind of stuff. Yet I will say to you that in the past couple of weeks, several weeks ago, we had some um, shares, and it was amazing some of the testimonies that came back to us 
from people who normally would not hear or have seen our services. And we've had people giving testimonies of how the message and so forth and the different things had touched their life. And so it's an incredibly important way. But I, I don't I like to appear like, hey, look at me. <laughs> look how great I am. Ain't I great? I know who I am. Trust me. I'm the hot mess express, all right? And, but by the grace of God, go there I, right? Amen. So anyhow, I'm going to speak a message to you today that is part of the sermon series that a number of churches are, are doing in the area. And the, today, the, the theme of the whole series has been Stronger Together. Today's message is Stronger Together through Serving. And I think you'll see in a few moments why I believe it's so important for every facet of our life. Uh, so I'm going to begin with Matthew chapter 20. It says, Then the mother, of, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine will sit one on your right hand and one on your left. That's Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. All right. Now, let me stop there for a moment. <laughs> in Luke's, or Mark's gospel, the mother's not mentioned. It says that the two, James and John, came and asked this request of him. So what we see between the mothers and what we see between the mother and the sons is here they come, and this is a, a, an ambitious request. Uh, it could be an ambitious mother, ambitious sons. They're coming. Hey, this is what we want. We want position. We want power. We want authority. We want to be great. We want a seat on each side of you, right? Think about that. I mean, it's an amazing thing. And now this is... Um, it's really selfish ambition that we can talk about. It is selfish ambition. It's wrapped up in pride. It's wrapped up in power. It's wrapped up in position. It's wrapped up in I want to be better than others. It's wrapped up in all of that. Now, I want you to think about this. There were 10 other guys. There's 12 of them. Out of 12 of them, two come to Jesus and said, hey, if you got two seats, one on each side of you, we want them. Let them out. <laughs> like, let them out. We don't... I don't care about those other 10. Now, you say, they say, let me, let me give this to you. How many know that sounds like Little League? <laughs> it sounds like soccer. It sounds like football, right? It sounds like all that stuff where the parents get in the way. Here comes mama. I want my son on the left. I want my, I'm just telling you right now. My mother would have said, I want, I want him to have the seat in the middle. <laughs> she said, I want him in one of those seats, right? And most of us know that when it comes to our kids, we want what we want for them. Now watch what happens. But here's the problem. They're coming. They have a selfish request, a selfish ambition. And now the other ten heard it. The other ten heard it. And here's what the Bible says. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. <laughs> imagine this. I mean, just imagine it. You're the twelve You've been chosen by Jesus. You've all been walking with him. Here comes those two, those two th sons of thunder. They're the big mouths anyhow. And they come over. Oh, by the way, Jesus, <laughs> it's us. We want that seat and that seat. And you're watching this and you're hearing this. And how many of you would be ticked when you heard that? You absolutely would be. And all of a sudden, it causes stuff to come out of them. And now they are indignant. They are angry. They are resentful. They are bitter towards them for this request. You see, because one of the things we have to remember is that selfish ambition brings self-inflicted affliction. Selfish ambition will bring self-inflicted affliction. Some of the reason that some of the people are sometimes angry with us is because we're selfish. Have you ever had anybody angry with you because you're selfish? You, you and I both know that we live in the age of social media where it is the world of look at me. Let me tell you how great I am. Okay? And I, okay, self-promotion, it's, oh goodness, it's, it's actually sickening at times. But what happens is when we operate in that spirit of self-ambition, it will bring self-inflicted affliction where there will be those who actually come against us. Because I'm going to show you something. I'm gonna, let me wrap this part of it up. Selfish ambition is the promotion of self to sit and serve beside Jesus while sitting over my brothers. 
Like I'm okay. Like I'm okay with this. I want to sit beside Jesus, and, and I'm okay. I just, but, but being beside Jesus puts me a little bit above you. Puts me just a little. Like like I'm on this platform today. I'm above all of you. Right? Think about what they were saying. They were literally saying, we want to be greater than you, 10. We want to be above you, 10. We want to sit beside Jesus. We want the seat of authority, the seat of power. We want the seat of recognition. We want that seat of, of, of fame. We want that seat. And they became angry. They became upset. This, this sounds, almost sounds like Joseph and his brothers. Well, you think, you, you think we're going to bow down to you, you little punk? Right? Selfish ambition breeds anger, resentment, indignation, strife, contention, and ultimately division. And it will weaken the cause of Christ in any church. It will weaken the cause of a nation in any part of government. Where self, selfish ambition will weaken families. Selfish ambition will weaken local governments. Selfish ambition will weaken your business. Anybody that have employees that understand when they operate by selfish ambition, yet employers can be selfish as well. It will division, it, division will hinder the body of Christ. It will weaken the cause of Christ. You know, you have people wanting to lord over. Now, here's the question. Not a question, but listen. So watch this. So, I want to talk to you for a moment about this selfish ambition. James says this. James says, but if you have bitter jealousy... And selfish ambition in your heart. Do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. How many ever try? I mean, how many ever try to convince yourself you're not selfish? How'd that go? Right? How many know we all have ambition? You got to frame it. I don't want to hire a person that doesn't have ambition. I want them to have the ambition framed in Christ. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. The wisdom, this wisdom, is not that which comes down from above. But it is earthly, natural, and demonic. Whew. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Let me give you a couple definitions. First of all, that word selfish means electioneering or intriguing for office. <laughs> Partisanship or fractious, fractiousness. I read this definition, I couldn't, I was like, my, my jaw just dropped. Went, <laughs> you talk about an era where this is highlighted, where there is electioneering going on, where there is partisanship that you can't even believe, where there is fractiousness that is rampant, where the common good is put aside for selfish ambition on either side of a governmental aisle. aisle. It is amazing to me. So it means electioneering or intriguing for office, partisanship or fraction. Fra I can't even say that word. All right. <laughs> All right. The words, that word that's used there in the Greek is found before New Testament times only in Aristotle, where it denotes a self-seeking pursuit of political office by unfair means. Oh, Lord, help us. Oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> a pursuit of political office by unfair means. <laughs> we got an election this year, and oh, my goodness. You and I both know that, that it's almost anything at all costs right now, Right? Let me show you the next word. Disorder. It's instability, a state of disorder, disturbance, and confusion. Wow. So he's saying selfish ambition brings instability, disorder, disturbance, and confusion. That's right. We are living in a day of extreme electioneering for office, partisanship, fractious spirits, and the self-seeking pursuit of political office by unfair means. We are living in this era. We are living in this, and I'm talking about the government for just a moment. But I will tell you, this same garbage sometimes exists in the church. This same stuff sometimes will exist in the workplace. This same stuff will exist, all right? 
And so all of a sudden, what we have now in our country is we have this extreme electioneering that's going on. It is about for the highest office of the, uh, uh, of the country. There is a fractious spirit. There is partisanship running rampant. And there's self-seeking pursuit uh, of political office by any means necessary. And because of that, we have disorder. We have uh, disturbances. We have confusion. We ha that is the result. How many know we have a confused country? How many know we have disorder and instability in our country because of this thing right here? But I will say to you that you're watching this as a church, as a believers. The same thing happens in churches when that political process moves in. When it's about electioneering, when it's about partisanship, when it's about fractiousness, and when it's about self-seeking pursuit of something, it is a place of confusion, it is a place of disturbance, and it is a place where every evil thing exists. And I'll take it beyond the local body, for the body of Christ at large in the city, when it gets broke down between denominational lines, when it's about proving who's right, who's wrong, when it becomes anything about Jesus, when it becomes partisan in that I'm Baptist, I'm Pentecostal, I'm Methodist, I'm this, I'm that, all of a sudden, we are, we are in a place where there's confusion in the body of Christ, there's a disturbance in the body of Christ, and there's disorder in the body of Christ because of selfish ambition. Oh boy, I'm having fun today. It's the suit. It always makes me angry. <laughs> I'm in the suit because it's Mother's Day. I did it for my mama. All right? He's got a suit on today. It's going to be an angry sermon. I ain't angry. I'm loving God, man. So I want to show you something. So now watch this. So here's, watch what's happening. So these two come to Jesus. We want that seat in that seat. Selfish ambition. Pursuit of this selfish position that they want. The other ten hear it. They're ticked off. Division starts to enter into the disciples of Jesus. Fractiousness is starting to come in. Partisanship is trying to come in, which then is going to lead itself to disorder, instability, and this confusion. Jesus hears it. But Jesus called them to himself. Let me stop there for a moment. I, it's just, I want to play on that phrase for a moment. He called them to himself. The truest place of unity in the body of Christ is in Christ. When you find yourself getting partisan, when you find yourself getting fractious, when you find yourself getting divided, get back into Christ. Because in Christ, you will always be in unity. When, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when your marriage is on the rocks and your marriage is, is fracturing, get into Christ. When, you're, when your family is falling apart, get into Christ. When your church is falling into division, pastors, get everybody back into Christ. Because it's only in Christ where you find perfect unity. But Jesus called to himself and said, you know that the rollers of the Gentiles, ungodly, the world, lord over them, and their great men exercised authority over them. Matthew 20, 25. So Jesus called them, listen, guys, this is the way the world operates. This is what the Gentiles do. This is what the ungodly do. Right? They, they lord over. They exercise authority. You see, the way of the world is to achieve greatness by overpowering you, controlling you, and serving my interest as I live in full privilege over you. That's literally what it means when you begin to look it up. When you look this word up, when you look up um, the, the words, Lord over, when you look up that word, it literally means to have privilege, have full privilege over you. Wow. There's a whole lot of people that are seeking power and position so they can lord over you and have full privilege over you. There are those who would just love for you to be under their thumb and under their finger and control you. They want greatness through lordship. They want greatness through power. They want greatness by bringing people under power. They want greatness by getting enough votes. They want greatness by controlling people, by overpowering you to serve me and my interests. You see, the way of the world is to achieve greatness by overpowering and controlling and you serving my interest as I live with full privilege over you. This happens in every facet of our life. It happens in the government sector where there are people that want to gain power to exercise control, to exercise authority, to lord over and to have full privilege over you and I. 
It happens, it, listen to me, it happens in families where some people, some of you, some of us, sometimes we need to remember we're dad, we're not Lord. We're a father, we're not Lord. We're daddy, we're not lording over them, right? We're not lording out. Yes, we have authority, I understand all that. I'm not talking about the abuse, I'm not talking about authority, I'm talking about the abuse of authority. There's a difference. And yet sometimes we look around as Lord of the manor rather than the father in the house. And we use fear and we use intimidation and we use power to control and to manipulate. We, business owners, I've seen business owners do it, where it's a spirit of control, it's a spirit of power, it's a spirit of lording over. And I would even go as far as to say that in our businesses that we are serving those who are under us. I, I want to say about pastors, oh my gosh, I have seen some lordship pastors and they need to get a grip, and they need to get a wake-up call, and they need to get off their high horse and get some humility into their life and begin to serve the people again. You don't need somebody to carry your Bible. Go, baby. He's on a roll now. Carry your own stinking Bible. Carry your own stinking coat. Carry your own bottle bottle, water bottle. <laughs> oh, man, he's right. He's going to start really meddling. I, I, I had a guy here at the church one time, and I liked the guy. But I gotta tell you something. I watched it and I just ah, that's Greek for it. I can't stand it. <laughs> and I just I just I just watched how the people around him were like these little lackeys. And I understand honor. I like to honor people, but forced honor is not honor. And and I'm watching waiting at the waiting at the car door with his coat, waiting at the car door with his bottle. I got your Bible, I got your coat. They open the door up for him and he walks through while the woman, the lady, is holding the door. Hello. Chivalry has not died in the body of Christ. The man opens the door for the woman. How about a little bit of ex, uh, exercise, a little bit of humility. Okay, I feel so much better. I'm going through therapy right now. <laughs> I mean, come on, can we get a grip? Not many were wise, not many were noble when he called us. Come on, pastor, get a grip. Be humble. Okay. You see, the way of the world creeps into every facet of our life, even the body of Christ. Jesus says, but it's not this way among you. It's not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Do you want to be great among the brothers? Serve the brothers. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. I mean, none of us want to be a slave. Right? None of us really want to be a slave. We talked about the way of the world. The way of the kingdom is to achieve greatness by coming under you, by being controlled by your interest, and giving you full privilege over me. So I can serve you. Oh, this is what Jesus did. The way of the kingdom of God. He says, look, this is the way the Gentiles do it. They lord over. They seek power. They want to be great by controlling you, overpowering you, and then having full privilege over you so you serve them. But that's not the way of this kingdom. This kingdom, the way of this kingdom, is that we come under others. I come under you. I'm controlled by what's best for you, your interest. And I'm giving you full privilege over me so I can serve you. Whew. If you're a political leader watching this sermon for some reason, you're a public servant. You are not Lord of the manor. I'm not being mean. I'm not being, I'm not being harsh. You're a statesman to serve the people. You are, you are a public servant who spent, who's supposed to be controlled by the interest of your constituents. You are not supposed to be a partisan. You are not meant to be fractious. You are not meant to be having a position so you have full privilege over everybody else. No, 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 no. That is not why God has put you into a position of authority. And there is no authority that has not been established by him. And when you operate in a self-seeking manner, you are going against the very purpose for which God put you into that position. If we would get leaders who would come back to the place 
of servanthood versus lordship, we would have far less partisanship, fractiousness, and division in our country, in our local government, in our families. Being controlled by your interest is an indication I'm controlled by God's interest. Jesus was all about the interest of God. He was all about God's will, God's way, God's plan, God's purposes, God's interest. And because he was more concerned, he, because he was concerned about God's interest, he then was concerned about the interest of men and women. That he served the interest of humanity because he served the interest of his father. When we come to the place where we're more concerned about the interest of God than we are our own interest, we will serve the interest of others. Willingly, when I will, yeah, okay. Willingly coming under you is an indication I have come under God. The world works from a power structure of lording over, coming over, gaining control. The kingdom, the power of the kingdom of God is coming under and serving up. And again, when we do that, it is not saying we don't have authority. We do have authority given to us by him. Authority to serve. Authority to do. Jesus used his authority to serve humanity. He didn't use his authority for selfish measures. When I willingly come under you to serve you is an indication I've come under God. Serving you is an indication I'm serving God. Right? Like, because when I'm serving you, it's God I'm serving. Paul, why did Paul do what Paul did? Why did he serve like he did? Shipwrecks, beatings, imprisonment. Why? He was serving God by serving the people. You see, because what we've got to remember is this. That just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. How many know Jesus is the model? You want a model? It's Jesus. Thank God we have a perfect model of what it looks like. Thank God the model is not the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Thank God it's not Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, Donald Trump, or any other figurehead you want to put out there. We've got a model in the body of Christ on what it looks like to serve. On what it looks like to serve in the spirit of Christ. You see, because this is what Jesus did. Jesus willingly came under the Father and was controlled by our interests and gave others full privileges so that he could serve us by giving his life as a ransom. Calvary was Christ serving us. The cross was Christ serving us. His death was him serving us. His death was saying, I'm coming under this for your interest. You see, let me, uh, let me bring this to some practical application. Your family will be stronger together when together you willingly come under each other. Your family will be stronger together when together you willingly come under each other. When a husband comes under the wife, wife comes under the husband. When children come under the parents. When parents at times come under the children to serve them. When you do that together, your family cannot help but be stronger together. You can't help it. Your family will be stronger together when together you are controlled by the interest of each other, not your own interest. Stop being selfish, mom. Stop being selfish, dad. Stop being selfish, kids, and all the parents said, <laughs> right? You, you see, because listen to me, when you are in a family setting where there's selfish ambition reigning in somebody or several, how many of you know there is disorder? There's confusion. There's all this stuff that happens, right? But when you come together 
and you're controlled by the interest of each other. Where this is, I, I want to do this, but this isn't in your best interest, therefore I won't do it. I want to be, I want to be selfish. I want to spend this money on me and what I want, but I know that it's not serving your interest. I, I, I want to sit in front of the TV and play computer games for 472 hours straight. But it is not in your best interest. Your family will be stronger together when, together, you give each other full privilege over self. That I'm not, you're not here to be a, so that I have privilege over you. I give you privilege over me. Your family will be stronger together when together you serve each other. You serve each other. If you got small kids, teach your kids to serve. Teach them to serve. They'll never go wrong learning how to serve. They'll never go wrong learning how to be humble. They'll never go wrong learning how to put others before themselves. They'll never, don't worry about them being a doormat. No, 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 no. The path to greatness in the kingdom of God is servanthood. Teach them how to serve. Now let me talk about the church because we found a theme for the church. The church is stronger together when together we willingly come under each other. That I'm coming under you, you come under me. We come under each other. Serving, loving. Man, it's in the church sometimes where some of the worst political spirits live. I've told you this before. When politics move into a church, the prophetic moves out. You can't, they, they, they just don't exist. Jesus said, you, you beware of the hair, leaven of the hair. Uh, yeah, 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 I can talk. You beware of the leaven of Herod. Herod was a political spirit. And you be careful of that leaven. The church is stronger together when together we are controlled by the interest of each other and not our own interest. We don't have lobbyists in the church. Oh, we got lobbyists. They sit in the lobby. <laughs> right? But we don't have lobbyists. Where lobbyists are about special interest groups pandering for a vote and pandering for this or that. No, 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 no. That's not who we are. I'm controlled by your interest and you're controlled by mine. The church is stronger together when together we give each other full privilege over ourselves. How many know this is hard to do? <laughs> the church is stronger together when together we serve each other. You see, we are stronger together when Together, I serve you, you serve me, and we serve others. One of the four things we talk about, Transformation Church. Remember the number four? Too bad the Tyrone section isn't here to tell us what they are. We all know that the Tyrone section would tell us exactly what they are. The four things we do to see our city transformed. We bless the city, we love the city, we invest in the city, and we serve the city. And serving the city, we serve him. It's an extension of our hands, extension of our love. It's an extension of our resources. We serve the city. Because I will promise you this. When a church will serve its city, it will prosper in the city. The church will prosper. The city will prosper. Because how many of you know servanthood is the pathway to greatness? And it's not about being great. That's not the goal. But we need to come to a place where we're stronger together when together I serve you. And I don't mind it. I like it. You serve me. And together, let's go serve others. And who are the others? The others aren't each other. The other isn't just the church. The other is sinners. The other is the ungodly. The other is the world. The other is those that Jesus came to serve. But here's the question. But why, why, why come under somebody? Why come under others? Why be controlled by the interest of others? I just need to stop right now and have all of you who are in the room Turn and look at Pastor Troy back there. He's sitting on a couch, for those of you online. He's got a couch in the corner that he's sitting on. This is pathetic. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This is exactly about selfish ambition. Everybody else is sitting in a chair. Everybody else is in a chair. And he's in a couch like the king on the throne. Can somebody get him a drink? Somebody get him some food, please. 
Do not edit this out. You see, but why, why come under others? Why be controlled by the interests of others? Why give others privilege over me? Why should I do this? What is the very foundation of why I do it? Love. 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 Let me take you to this as I get ready to close and give you those three famous words. Go away, Troy. <laughs> it was just before Passover. And Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now was going to show them, watch this, he was now going to show them the full extent of his love. It would only be a matter of time till he died on the cross because he loved us. But for these 12, the Bible says he was going to show them the full extent of his love for them right here in that moment. And how was he going to show them the full extent of his love? Is when he, the king, he the greater, got up, took off his robe, took a basin, took a towel, and began to wash the feet of dirty, stinky, smelly fishermen. As he humbled himself and began to wash their feet. Because love is the fountain from which service flows. Love is the fountain from which service flows. Love is best founded when it is grounded in love. I'm sorry, service is best founded when it is grounded in love. The whole reason that Jesus did what he did was because of another verse that we're so familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love is the reason I serve my family. Love is the reason we come under each other in our family. Love for our children, love for our spouse is why we do that. In the church, love for each other, love for God. Because how many know it is our love for God that becomes the fountain for which we serve others? Because we begin to serve in the Father's heart. Come on, Troy. Listen to me. I don't care what sphere of life you are. Whatever it is, whatever it is you're part of, every facet of your life will be better and stronger together when we serve in the Spirit of Christ. If you are a politician today, I say to you, stop being a politician and be a statesman. Stop pandering for votes and lead. Stop pandering for votes and looking for the vote. And stop living according to partisanship and come to a place where you serve in the spirit of Christ. When you serve without selfish ambition, without partisanship, without fractionness, without looking to have full privilege, if you're a pastor today, you've not been called to be Lord of the house. You've been called to serve the Lord of the kingdom. And we serve the Lord of the kingdom as we serve others. And we come under others in the spirit of Christ. That when he gives authority, he gives authority to serve. When he gives power, he gives power to serve. To power to protect. He gives power to provide. Listen to me, we've got to come to a place that we understand where our strength comes from. We must understand where our greatness comes from. And it comes from the ability to humble ourselves, come under others, serve others, look, at, look out for their interests more than ours, and say, you have privilege over me. The reason I say it's such an important message is because if we can get this down, if we could get it down, we, this is going to really sound like meddling. <laughs> For the last couple of years, every time there was a school board meeting, it was a 5-4 vote. 5-4, every meeting, every vote. And I'm not telling you which side's right. I don't know which side's right. But I know that when every meeting and every vote is 5-4, there is division. And where there is division and selfish ambition, there is disorder and strife of every kind. Somehow, some way, the best interest of all has to come to the forefront. You cannot exist and have harmony and strength in a 5-4 vote every time. 
And but yet, but yet I say to churches, you can't live in this, this political era. No, 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 no. We're not planting her votes in the body of Christ. We're coming under each other. We're serving each other. We're loving each other. There are no partisan lines. I say to the body of Christ at large throughout the city, remove some of the lines that we've, uh, we've drawn and consider one another more important. So, Father, today, help us. Help us to church, first of all. And while, yes, there are ways that we should vote and there are principles that we want to stand upon, may we truly understand that our power does not come from the ways of the world. Our power does not come from winning political processes and lording over. If that was the case, you would have became king when you came to the earth the first time. Our power rests within our ability to humble ourselves in your fashion, to serve our neighbor, to serve our brother, to serve our sister, to serve each other, to serve other churches. So Father, help us with that. Help us. Help us run with that. It'll make our businesses better. It'll make our families stronger. It'll make our churches stronger. It'll make our community stronger. It'll make our nation stronger. Raise up, God, raise up men and women who say we're servants. Servants who have a love for you and a love for this city and a love for this nation and a love for other people that would say, I'm going to serve. I'm not going to hold privilege over them. And I say to you today, and as I close, all of us need to remember that Jesus was the one who was the greater, who came to the earth and humbled himself and took on the form of a man so that he could live a sinless life conquering sin that served our interest, so that he'd go to the cross and give his life for our interest, so he could go to the grave and be raised from the dead for our interest. That's what he did for us. He's so good. He's so good. And today we would be remiss if we didn't say thank you, Jesus, for looking out and serving us. And because you served us, we want to serve you as we serve each other. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing joy.